people have been developing ways to overcome their social media addictions. And the first thing is they actually want to raise awareness that they're engaged in this. So what happens when you go on a calorie diet? You write down what you eat each day. And so people have been talking about digital nutrition and they've been speaking about a way to document the activities you're engaged in online so that you can reflect and say, well, okay, today I ate too much or I was on the screen too much. Um, so if the average person is spending about 11 and a half hours in front of a multiplicity of screens a day, then you want to reduce that amount of time and you want to be able to replace that activity that you would usually do in front of a screen with some other activity, like in the physical world. And so there have been different mechanisms people have thought of, software programs to monitor usage of Facebook, how often you click to get alerts back on the screen to tell you, you know, you've been using this too, too often today, um, printouts or, or visual dashboards at the end of the day um, showing you, you know, how your day went in terms of busy hour of usage towards the time that you didn't use it. So if, you're, if you can get your profile looking like it should, for example, no more than one hour at most uh, on social media per day, and I would advocate a few minutes per day, then you can continue to use the tool for its functionality, which is to share. But if you're having a problem, you can invest in different types of software that give you these alerts. You know, one of the ones I was looking at more recently was a wrist rester for your keyboard, uh, which zapped you, sends very small amounts of electric shock, like a Pavlov nudge, it's called, to get you off and thinking, well, you've been on that Facebook page now three times, it's three times and you're out. We won't let you log back in. So different universities like Harvard uh, and so forth are looking at solutions for this social media addiction or at least this alertness. One of my PhD students came in a few months ago and said to me, I'm investing uh, in a Fitbit. And I said, that's great. What for? Oh, well, he said, you know, I'm always sitting down at the computer. I need to get my step up, steps up. I need to look better. And I said to him, well, that's very interesting. I said, you know, ever since these Fitbits went on sale, you know, everyone who's wearing them should look like fantastic. And then why don't you? And so we had a conversation around the Fitbit and its usefulness. And he said to me, well, the watch actually has an alert that makes you get up and move, you know. And recently having spoken to him, basically you ignore the alert. The novelty effect wears off. And so these devices that promise that we're going to look muscular, healthy, and fit don't live up to their promises. And some of the more sinister devices, like human activity monitors, send this data back to the cloud. And so the human is being monitored right down to the actual step location in the house. And so we're being decorporealized. We're being segmented into pieces. And our very states of sleep, our REM state, for example, is being monitored through these devices. And if we choose to share them to the cloud, then other people can see when we were sleeping, when we were walking, when we were at rest. And some people even argue, perhaps even when we're making love, if we've got these monitors on. So these sensors are very revealing. They tell people about how fast our heart rate is going, how fast our pulse rate's going, whether we've had any sleep or are heavily sleep deprived. And this kind of data in the hands of the wrong company can be used to denote whether you could be a pilot in the future, whether you've got the nerves to be um, in a very stressful job, for example. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have the wool put over our eyes that these companies are providing these free services for nothing.